Hey, welcome back! Today we're going to be talking about Henry the Fourth, Part One, one of Shakespeare's most beloved history plays. It includes an excellent cast of characters, including the very popular and beloved Falstaff, as well as exploring the childhood of one of England's great heroes at the time, Henry V. The play picks up right after Richard II and explores what Henry IV is like as a king. And with that story, we have to deal with the burden of guilt and weight since Richard II was deposed and eventually murdered. And Henry IV, to some extent, struggles both internally and externally with the consequences of that and with his own involvement in that. Meanwhile, we're also interested in his son, Prince Hal, who ultimately becomes Henry V. In Henry's previous history tetralogy, which explores the, the history of Henry VI and Richard III, we saw several poisonous relationships between fathers and sons. And in big part, it was about the failure of sons to live up to their father's reputation. This story is a different journey. Henry IV bears some weight of his own guilt, and his son, Prince Hal, who seems to be something of a rascal at the beginning of the story, is through this process growing and learning to become a hero king. Now, of course, there are varying opinions on how successful he ultimately is. His plan is going to require him turning his back on a lot of his early friends, and that feels rather painful, especially in part two. But Shakespeare is clearly also exploring strains of heroism and nobility in Prince Hal, even from the beginning, as he struggles to become a worthy son to his father and a worthy heir to the throne. Also, as is frequently true in Shakespeare's plays, the characters on all sides of the story are richly developed and very sympathetic. We can't help but love Falstaff, even though he's a rotten old lying scoundrel. And we can't help but feel for Hotspur and his family. Shakespeare knows how to teach us the humanity of each of his characters and delve into our sympathy. In some ways, this story is a tale of two Harrys. There's Prince Hal, or Harry, who's going to become Henry V, and his growth into manhood. But we have a doppelganger, another Harry, and that is Harry Percy Hotspur. And Harry Percy is such a phenomenal fighter who has accomplished such noble deeds that everyone admires him, most especially Prince Hal's father, Henry IV. But Hotspur has also earned his nickname for being hot-headed and impulsive and rash. And on the one hand, Hotspur shines in the limelight for his great deeds, and yet he becomes a traitor, while Prince Hal, who's still hidden in the shadows of his light reputation, ultimately comes into his own in this play. And the contrast between these two Harrys is what's going to drive the majority of the play. And yet the most poignant moments don't happen because of a contrast between Harry and Harry, but rather in the moments when Prince Hal is wrestling with the steps he's going to have to take in order to live up to his father's reputation and become a noble king. Let's go through the play now. Act one begins with King Henry IV, who is dealing with the aftermath of the death of Richard II. And in his heart, he desires to go to Jerusalem. He's had a dream of going to Jerusalem, to the Holy Land on a crusade, and in some ways doing penance for his role in the death of Richard II. However, he's interrupted in his dreams and his desires by civil strife. In Wales, Owen Glendower has captured Mortimer, one of Henry's relatives. Also, we hear of the action of Hotspur, young Harry Percy, son of Northumberland, who has achieved great victories, and in fact, it reminds the king of his own ne'er-do-well son. Henry IV says, Yea, there thou makest me sad, and makest me sin in envy, that my lord Northumberland should be the father of so blessed a son, a son who is the theme of honor's tongue, amongst a grove the very straightest plant, who is sweet fortune's minion and her pride, whilst I, by looking on the praise of him, see riot and dishonor, stain the brow of my young Harry. Oh, that it could be proved that in some night-tripping fairy had exchanged in cradle clothes our children where they lay, and called mine Percy and his Plantagenet. Then would I have his Harry and he mine. So immediately we see 
the contrast between the two Harrys. And we also see that King Henry IV is regretting the frailties of his own son, the fact that his son does not seem to be very interested in acts of nobility, but rather hangs around Eastcheap with a bunch of ruffians. But we also find out that Percy, Hotspur, is keeping his prisoners to himself and not turning them over to the king, which shows hints of rebellion, and so the king feels he needs to address this. Meanwhile, we jump over to see what our Prince Hal is doing, and he's hanging out with Sir John Falstaff. And our conversations between Hal and Falstaff are some of the most enjoyable parts of Shakespeare. Falstaff is an incredibly jovial, a horrible old drunk. He's greedy and cowardly, but in such a cheerful, charming way. He is, as some people have noted, the eternal child, constantly feeding his appetites and never really growing up. The prince is constantly teasing him and jabbing him over his gut and over his appetites and over his horrible habits. And Falstaff is always coming up with very creative and clever excuses for himself. Falstaff at one point in this early conversation says, Do not thou, when thou art king, hang a thief. And the prince replies, No, thou shalt. In other words, Falstaff says, You ought to just let the thieves go. Let the thieves be do their thing. Don't hang any of them. And the prince puns that Falstaff shall hang as a thief. But in this scene, Falstaff is attempting to convince the prince to join them on an excursion to rob some people on the highway. And then in comes Ned Poins, who is a noble who's got a bit of a rascal streak himself. And Poins and Hal come up with the plan to trick Falstaff and his cronies to pretend they're going to go rob with them, but then disappear and put on disguises and actually rob Falstaff. It's a lot of very jovial fun. But right at the end of this scene, when the prince is suddenly alone, he has a soliloquy. And in it, we have this moment of stepping out of his character in a reflection, a recognition of who he is and what he has to become. He says, I know you all, and will a while uphold the unyoked humor of your idleness. Yet herein will I imitate the sun, who doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world, that when he please again to be himself, being wanted, he may be more wondered at by breaking through the foul and ugly mists of vapors that did seem to strangle him. If all the year were playing holidays, to sport would be as tedious as to work. But when they seldom come, they wished for come, and nothing pleaseth but rare accidents. So in this loose behavior I throw off and pay the debt I never promise it, by how much better than my word I am. By so much shall I falsify men's hopes, and like bright metal on the sullen ground, my reformation, glittering o'er my fault, shall show more goodly and attract more eyes than that which hath no foil to set it off. I'll so offend to make offense a skill, redeeming time when men think least I will. In other words, by constantly playing games and, and goofing off, as a young man, when it is his moment to shine, and he steps up and he actually lives nobly, it will be like the sun breaking through the clouds, and then he'll shine all the brighter at that moment. This speech of a glorious sort of shining light um, as, as the sign of, of a king who is reigning is going to be mirrored in Act 3 by Henry IV. And so we get this glimpse into the inner prince, who, although he's enjoying the games of childhood, and certainly Falstaff is a very charming companion, yet someday the prince is going to step away from this world into the role of the noble hero. Meanwhile, in scene three, we have the king who is standing before Northumberland and Worcester and Harry Percy. And the king is questioning them on their lack of cooperation. Worcester is clearly agitated. And we have to remember back to Richard II when Worcester and Northumberland both helped Henry to get back into England after he was exiled. And they thought he was just trying to recover his dukedom because his exile had been awfully unjust. They didn't expect him to rise up from that moment and become king. And now they're very dissatisfied about that, especially since they helped him once and now he's treating them with some contempt. When the king questions why Hotspur didn't turn over his prisoners, Hotspur describes how some fancy, posh noble came up to him, completely disgusted by 
the gore and the, the smell of the battlefield and demanded the prisoners. And in that moment, Hotspur, who had just come out of battle, was so disgusted by the man that he refused. And Blunt leans forward to try to excuse him, but the king points out that Hotspur still has not turned over his prisoners. Sure, it may have been the moment of heat there, but, but now turn over the prisoners. And the demand that Hotspur makes is that before he'll turn over his prisoners, he wants the king to go redeem Mortimer, his wife's brother, from Owen Glendower in Wales. But the king has begun to mistrust the loyalty of Mortimer. After all, Mortimer, while being captured by Owen Glendower, decided to marry Owen Glendower's daughter. Not only that, but we find out that Mortimer has a claim to the throne, maybe stronger than Henry IV's. And it seems as though Richard II ultimately wanted him to be heir. So he refuses to redeem Mortimer, which angers Hotspur. The king and his entourage leave, and Hotspur is in quite a temper. And if the devil come and roar for them, I will not send them. I will after straight and tell him so, for I will ease my heart, albeit I'll make a hazard of my head. However, his father Northumberland and his uncle Worcester try to talk him down. They have a plan. It takes a moment to get Hotspur cooled enough to actually hear the plan, because he keeps having these outbursts. But eventually they advise him that because Mortimer maybe has a claim to the throne, they should team up instead with Owen Glendower and with a few other malcontents, and try to overthrow Henry IV and put Mortimer on the throne. And so we have our plot. Act two begins with the sequence of Falstaff and company preparing to rob some travelers. Gads Hill, Falstaff's friend, first goes and gets some info, and then the whole company sets out on the road to prepare to rob travelers. Poins and the prince are already messing with Falstaff. They've taken his horse and hidden it, and so he's had to walk a long way, which infuriates him since he's fat and doesn't like to walk anywhere. And just as it seemed that the travelers are coming down the road, Poins and the prince say that they're going to move down a little further so they can catch them if they escape from Falstaff, Bardolph, and Pato. So the travelers are caught unawares, and they're t bound and robbed, and Falstaff and the company are walking away and, and celebrating their haul, when all of a sudden out pops Poins and the Prince, disguised, and they rob the money back from them. Lots of delightful mischief by a bunch of rascals. And then we cut back to Harry Percy, who is much more seriously approaching a rebellion. Hotspur is reading a letter in which one of the people he hoped would join his side refuses to do so. And Hotspur realizes that this man will probably go straight to the king and tell of their plot. Whenever Hotspur faces a conflict or a problem, he just buckles down and charges forward. So he decides to go ahead and leave tonight and join the other rebels. But in this moment, in comes his wife, Kate Percy. And she knows something's up, but he's refused to tell her so far. And so here he is, obviously all worked up, and she tries to get straight answers out of him. This scene feels very similar to the scene in Julius Caesar, when Brutus is brooding in his garden, and his wife, Portia, comes out and tries to get answers out of him. In the end, she has to prove her strength in order to get answers out of him. And Kate Percy is rather a strong character here as well. There aren't many female characters in this play, but she's pretty tough. And similar to the scene in Julius Caesar, Hotspur is concerned about telling his plans to his wife because he's not sure he trusts a woman with the information. They have this sort of quick-tongued repartee where it seems like they really have this deep affection for each other, but also they're really kind of harsh with each other. At one point, Kate Percy threatens to break one of his fingers. Come, come, you paraquito, answer me directly into this question that I ask. In faith, I'll break thy little finger, Harry, and if thou wilt not tell me all things true. And in a parallel, but contrasted way to the scene in Julius Caesar, they talk about how much they love each other. By Hotspur saying, I love thee not, I care for thee not, Kate. In the Julius Caesar scene, by contrast, Brutus says, of course I love you, you're my wonderful, noble, honorable wife. And Portia says, no you don't, you'd love me by your actions. True marriage is a partnership where you share everything. It's an absolutely great scene and one well worth picking apart line by line. And if you'd like to look at this scene more deeply, I recommend looking at the scene with Shakespeare with Sarah. She's always fantastic with examining closely Shakespeare's language and meaning. 
On to scene four, we have the Prince and Poins waiting at the tavern in Eastcheap for Falstaff to come back defeated without the money. And while they're waiting, they play pranks on the waiter. In the middle of their game, Prince Hal says, I am not yet of Percy's mind, the hot spur of the North. He that kills some six or seven dozen of Scots at a breakfast, washes his hands and says to his wife, Fly upon this quiet life, I want bark! Oh, my sweet Harry, says she, how many hast thou killed today? Give me a roan ho horse a drench, says he, and answers, some fourteen, and an hour after, a trifle, a trifle. So Hal almost jealously comments upon Hotspur, how Hotspur has accomplished all these great deeds, and he seems so heroic, and oh, he can knock off fourteen men, no problem. Whereas Hal is just sitting around goofing off with his buddies. But in comes Falstaff, all upset and angry because he was abandoned by Poins and the Prince, and he lost all of his money. And he calls them cowards, and then he begins to tell his story how he was set upon by this enormous band of people. And how he fought them all to the death and killed several of them. And as he's telling the story, the number of people in the band continues to grow and grow and grow, much to Hal's and Poins' amusement. He even shows his sword that's all hacked up and dented from the fight. When he finally comes to the end of the story, the Prince and Poins reveal that they were the ones who robbed them all along, and they watched the whole thing. And Falstaff, you carried your guts away as nimbly and with as quick dexterity, and roared for mercy, and still run and roared, as I have ever heard a bull calf. What slave art thou to hack thy sword as thou hast done, and then say it was in a fight? What trick, what device, what starting hole canst thou now find out to hide thee from this open and apparent shame? How are you going to get out of this one, Falstaff? And Falstaff explains and says, oh, oh, it was my instinct. I would never hurt the heir apparent. I wasn't a coward. I was being a coward on instinct, like a lion. Why hear you, my masters, was it for me to kill the heir apparent? Should I turn upon the true prince? Why, thou knowest that I am as valiant as Hercules, but beware instinct. The lion will not touch the true prince. When suddenly they get news of the uprising in the north, and it sobers all of the mood. And now the prince is going to have to go back and see King Henry the Fourth and speak to his father, and when he does so, he's probably going to have to answer for his bad reputation. And so Falstaff sits up there and puts a cushion on his head and holds up his dagger and pretends to be Henry IV and tries to inquire of his son so that Prince Hal can practice his speech. And so Falstaff sets himself up in a role of being Hal's father, which is, of course, symbolically interesting, since he somewhat represents an eternal childhood, and yet here he is pretending to be the father. And in this position, he tries to excuse away his own faults, saying that Prince Hal should always, always spend his time with Falstaff. And the prince finally says, Dost thou speak like a king? Do thou stand for me, and I'll play my father. And so they switch roles. And the prince, as Henry IV, questions Falstaff, who is pretending to be the prince. He questions him over his relationship with Falstaff. There is a devil haunts thee in the likeness of an old fat man. A ton of man is thy companion. Why dost thou converse with that trunk of humors, that bolting hutch of beastliness, that swollen parcel of dropsies, that huge bombard of sack, that stuffed cloak bag of guts, that roasted manning tree ox with a pudding in his belly, that reverend vice, that gray iniquity, that father ruffian, that vanity in years. And so Falstaff begins to defend himself as Prince Hal. He says, But to say I know more harm in him than in myself were to say more than I know. That he is old, the more the pity. His white hairs do witness it. But that he is, saving your reverence, a whoremaster, that I utterly deny. If sack and sugar be a fault, God help the wicked. If to be old and merry be a sin, then many an old host that I know is damned. If to be fat, to be to be hated, then Pharaoh's lean kine are to be loved. No, my good lord, banish Pato, banish Bardolph, banish Poins, but for sweet Jack Falstaff, kind Jack Falstaff, true Jack Falstaff, valiant Jack Falstaff, and therefore more valiant being as he is old Jack Falstaff, banish not him thy Harry's company, 
Banish not him, thy Harry's company. Banish plump Jack, and banish all the world. And at that moment, the prince answers, I do. I will. Which has an incredible poignancy, because here is Falstaff defending himself and defending this cheerful, childish roguishness. And the prince, in this moment, whether literally out loud or somewhat more subtly, points out that ultimately, in order to step into his own, he's going to have to put aside Falstaff and everything that Falstaff represents. And this line, though very short, can be said in incredibly painful ways. Is this a moment where the, the joke suddenly falls, and the prince suddenly sort of opens his eyes and recognizes what his future holds? This line can be said with incredible emotion. In any case, the moment is immediately broken because the sheriff is at the door looking for Falstaff because he knows that Falstaff robbed some people. And so Falstaff hides behind an heiress and the prince covers for him for a moment, but recognizes also that at this point he's going to have to go and um, take his responsibility a bit more seriously. It's time for him to go to war. And after finding that Falstaff has fallen asleep behind the heiress, they pick his pocket and read his bill about how much he's been drinking lately. And the prince decides that he's going to give Falstaff a charge of foot, which means that he's going to be leading a bunch of foot soldiers, so that he'll have to walk in the wars, much to his horror. The end of Act 2. Act 3 begins with all of the rebels planning what they're going to do and how they're going to divide up the land. Owen Glendower is full of words of prophecy and this sort of supernatural talk, which absolutely drives Hotspur crazy. And Hotspur's willing to argue over every little point, because he just loves to argue. Mortimer's trying to keep the peace between the two of them. And the scene shifts as Glendower brings the ladies in, and Mortimer's wife, who speaks only Welsh, which he doesn't understand, sings them a song in Welsh. And this is a very romantic scene between Mortimer, who can't speak to his wife, and his wife, which is coupled with Hotspur and his wife, who half an affection and half an irritation poke back and forth at each other. He tries to get her to sing, but she's not going to sing to him. In scene two, Hal goes before his father and tries to reconcile himself and uh, repent his faults. His father expresses his disappointment and again creates a contrast between his own son and Hotspur. And he talks about nobility, again, as something that should be ready to shine in the right moment, which like I said, mirrors the previous speech of Prince Hal. But Harry's reputation seems to be marring it. And Henry IV feels Hal's reputation so deeply that he feels like maybe Hal is one of his enemies. Maybe Hal would like to join the rebels and fight against him and overthrow him. The prince answers, Do not think so. You shall not find it so. And God forgive them that so much have swayed your majesty's good thoughts away from me. I will redeem all this on Percy's head, and in the closing of some glorious day, be bold to tell you that I am your son, when I will wear a garment all of blood, and stain my favors in a bloody mask, which, washed away, shall scour my shame with it. And that shall be the day, when e'er it lights, that this same child of honor and renown, this gallant Hotspur, this all-praised knight, and your unthought-of Harry chance to meet. For every honor sitting on his helm, would they be multitudes, and on my helm my shames redoubled. For the time will come that I shall make this northern youth exchange his glorious deeds for my indignities. Percy is but my factor, good my lord, to engross up glorious deeds on my behalf. And I will call him to so strict account that he shall render every glory up. Yea, even the slightest worship of his time, or I will tear the reckoning from his heart. This in the name of God I promise here, the which, if he be pleased, I shall perform. I do beseech your majesty may solve the long-grown wounds of my intemperance. If not, the end of life cancels all bands, and I will die a hundred thousand deaths, ere break the smallest parcel of this vow. So he swears to reverse his and Percy's roles. Percy, this one who's won all of these honors and he's won all of these indignities, they're going to reverse. He is going to stand up and show himself his true nobility and be his father's son. He's going to overcome Percy in combat. And in doing so, he's going to win glory over Percy and um, be honored of his father. And so they set out. 
back in the inn. Falstaff is arguing with the hostess because somebody picked his pocket and he lost all this great cash. Of course, we know that he had nothing in his pockets because it was Hal who picked it. And Hal eventually reveals that to him. And he also reveals that he returned all of the money. And now it's time for them to set out to the wars. So Falstaff had better be ready because he's got his charge of foot that he's going to have to lead. Act 4 begins with some bad news for the Rebellion. Hotspur hears that his father Northumberland is sick and therefore will not be at the battle. We also have the bad news that Glendower is not quite ready to join them either. And a huge army from Henry IV is coming to meet them. But Hotspur refuses to be cast down by any of these hurdles and instead keeps looking at the optimistic side and, and being ready for the glory of the fight. In scene two, we see Falstaff, who has abused his position as officer in order to line his own pockets by allowing soldiers to bribe him to keep them out of the lists and impressing rather all of the worthless rabble into his army. He runs briefly into Hal and Westmoreland as they are heading off into the battle. In scene three, Sir Walter Blunt goes to the rebel army and presents before Hotspur a request that he and the other rebels come before the king and state their case. What is their grievance? Why are they coming to war against him? Hotspur again gives a thumbnail sketch of what happened with Richard II, but also agrees to send someone to express their grievances to the king. In scene four, the Archbishop of York and Sir Michael um, realize that things aren't looking too good for Hotspur, and because they are also conspirators, they begin to sweat. And that brings us to Act 5. Worcester and Vernon stand before the king and express their grievances, and Prince Hal offers single combat against Hotspur. Then King Henry offers to forgive the rebels if they will simply lay down their arms and yield. So Prince Hal is beginning to stand up as a very noble-looking figure. In fact, shortly before this in Act 4, Percy had heard about the prince coming, and he had scoffed at the prince, thinking that the prince would be not very impressive. But the people who have seen the prince have already begun to comment on the way he is looking so very noble at this point. In scene two, though, Worcester and Vernon have a conversation. They decide that they had better not convey the king's forgiveness to Hotspur, because Worcester thinks, well, if we get forgiven, he's going to be constantly watching me. And maybe Hotspur will be forgiven, but I'll get all the blame, since I'm the uncle who led him on. And so he decides his only recourse is to spur Hotspur on to battle. And so although they don't have Northumberland or Glendower, because Glendower was too busy looking at the signs and realizing maybe it wasn't the most auspicious day, they do have the Douglas. Hotspur hears about Hal's offer, and he's surprised to hear with what nobility Hal had stated it. And Hotspur is beginning to feel kind of gloomy about it, but he keeps up his energy. And uh, instead of giving a long speech, which is not his style, he just quickly kind of pats everybody on the back and says, let's go. Only this, let each man do his best. And here draw I a sword, whose temper I intend to stain with the best blood that I can meet with all in the adventure of this perilous day. Now, Esperance, Percy, and set on, sound all the lofty instruments of war, and by that music let us all embrace, for heaven to earth, some of us never shall a second time do such a courtesy. In scene three, we're in the midst of battle, and Sir Walter Blunt faces off with the Douglas. And the Douglas has been hunting for King Henry, but he keeps running into people who are dressed as King Henry because there are decoys, including Sir Walter Blunt. He kills Blunt and Hotspur comes on and says, ah, that wasn't the king. And away they charge. In comes Falstaff, who admits that his entire command was immediately decimated because they were worthless soldiers. And the prince runs in and asks for a sword because his own is broken. But Falstaff doesn't have a sword to give him. And so the prince runs away. Falstaff is dodging around while the prince is actively trying to pursue his enemies. In scene four, the king urges Hal to step off the battlefield because he's got some blood on him. It looks like he's been injured. But Prince Hal says, no, he's fine. And he dashes off for a moment. Then in comes the Douglas, who's finally found the real Henry IV. And the Douglas is about to beat Henry when the prince steps back onto the stage and rescues him. It's an incredibly important moment because King Henry IV sees his son come to his rescue. And he sees the heroism of his son, not only that, but also the affection that his son has for him. 
Hal could have let him die, but that thought never would have gone through Prince Hal's mind. Yet Henry, in his lack of confidence in his son, would have expected it. And so it's a, it's a moment between the two of them. The king then moves off of the stage and in comes Hotspur, ready to face off with Hal. And the moment we've sort of been waiting for this entire time is finally here. Harry versus Harry. The glorious noble Hotspur versus the prince of disrepute. But Prince Hal has stepped into a new role now and he's ready to fight. And so the two of them do face off and Hal wins. Hotspur says as he dies, Oh Harry, thou hast robbed me of my youth. I better brook the loss of brittle life than those proud titles thou hast won of me. They wound my thoughts worse than thy sword my flesh. But thoughts, the slaves of life, and life, time's fool, and time that takes survey of all the world, must have a stop. Oh, I could prophesy, but that the earthly and cold hand of dust lies on my tongue. No, Percy, thou art dust, and food for worms. It's the pain of this no-good prince who's taken all of his glory that hurts Percy most. And the prince, looking down at the body of Percy, says, Fare thee well, great heart. Ill-weaved ambition, how much art thou shrunk? When that this body did contain a spirit, a kingdom for it was too small a bound, but now two paces of the vilest earth is room enough. This earth that bears thee dead bears not alive so stout a gentleman. If thou wert sensible of courtesy, I should not make so dear a show of zeal but let my favors hide thy mangled face." And then he sees Falstaff, who was knocked over by the Douglas, and who is playing dead to avoid being hurt. And Hal thinks that he's dead, and he gives this moment of, he has this moment of grief as he sees this figure of this old man who's been so much of his childhood lying there dead. But as he steps off the stage, Falstaff sits back up, and he gives the famous line, the better part of valor is discretion. So by counterfeiting, by faking his his death, he got away. And then he looks over at Hotspur and he's like, oh, what if he's also counterfeiting? And so then he stabs Hotspur in the leg, just to make sure. And then the prince comes in with his younger brother, John of Lancaster, to get the body of Percy. But there they find Falstaff standing over it, and Falstaff claims that Hotspur was not dead, but popped back up and he killed him. And yet the prince chooses to let Falstaff take the glory for killing Hotspur. He says, come bring your luggage nobly on your back. For my part, if a lie may do thee grace, I'll gild it with the happiest terms I have. And so we come to the final scene. Worcester is captured and he is sent to be executed with Vernon. The Douglas is also captured and Hal asks if he can have charge over him. And he gives him a pardon for his valiant deeds because he killed so many men. And yet, things are not quite finished. We end the play knowing that we still have enemies out there, including Northumberland and Scroop and Glendower. There's still more to do. And so we'll pick up with the continuation of the story in Henry IV, Part Two. Thanks for watching. You can click to subscribe or to watch another video, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. However, he's interrupted in his dreams. <laughs>